Let's do the last part a bit rapidly, but I think you're up to it now. We're going to just make one more sort of extension of the situation that we have been looking at, but using the same methods. It's done under the heading of contingency tables. You could also call it frequency tables. For instance, like this. The, the extension is that now it's not only two proportions, it's not only many proportions, it's actually many proportions, ah, and then combined with the fact that it's not only a proportion, but it's not only a binary thing. It's like, uh, it's not only voting for Obama or Romney, it's actually polls where you take all the other candidates. There are actually a handful of other candidates over there, which we never hear of, but they are there. There is a lady on it for a Green Party, I don't remember her name. There are some other candidates. You could do polls where you ask, do you vote for this, 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 or this? So you, had a, you sort of have a five-category outcome instead of a two-category thing, right? It's not binary or anything like this, or even this is an example where you, you say candidate one, two, or something else are undecided. There's a, that could be having uh, three proportions. And then you do it three different at three different times, and you might test different hypotheses here, you might want to test. Do we have the same distribution of votes? Actually, this is to be not quite uh, exact, I should say i equal one, two, three here, that I would have the same proportions here, here, and here. Now there are like three proportions. In a way, it's easy. When, when, we, when it's a binary thing, we talk about a single proportion. We know there are two. There's always the proportion, and then there's the failure proportion, right? The success, the failure, and they add up to one, the proportion. And then, in a way, we could talk about it as one proportion, or we could talk about it as two proportions. Usually, we just say one, and then we know the other one is there. Now, when there are three, we cannot uh, just say one proportion. We could say two, because if we know two proportions, we would know the last one. But I would just, as a general way of talking about it, I would say three proportions here, always adding up to one. Proportion set here, proportion set here, proportion set here. I might want to test, are those three sets of proportions the same? So see, uh, is there any change in voting pattern in general? Not particularly the candidate one or candidate two, but also including the undecided proportion. Is the undecided proportion changing? That would be an extended way of looking at the situation. Here's another. Actually, there are two ways such tables can occur. I mean, in the way you decide and the way you design them, in the way they work out in practice. In this way, actually, we have n1 equal 200, we have n2 equal 200, and we have n3 equal 200. I decided that myself. I made a sample of 200 here, I made a sample of 200 here, I made a sample of 200 here. That was my decision. I decided the n. That's one way of such table. That is the same type of table, table as the, um, the birth control table. I decided, at least maybe, we don't know the true story behind it. It could be the same story. It, I decided yeah, I could make this sample. I decided I could make this sample. There is another situation producing a data table, frequency table, contingency table, that when you look at the numbers, they look the same way, but they appeared. They were created in a different way. For instance, if you sample people, do I have the numbers here or did I? I don't have the numbers. Anyway, if I sample a large group of people, I could test them on, let's say, I could test them on math and I could test them on I shouldn't test all of you on, on Danish, but we could test you on English then. I could do uh, two different measurements on each of you. I could sample you at random, then I could test you on English and categorize you in one of three groups, good, average, or bad. I could also test math skills on you, the same persons, and I could see are you good or are you bad or are you average on math. So I could make sort of a cross classification of people according to the two variables, the two categoricals, the two three-group variables that I am measuring. 
Then I get such a cross classification and still I could phrase the question in different ways now. I could say, is there among bad mathematics, mathematics people, is the English proportions different from the, for example, for example, for the good mathematics people, right? The people good at mathematics, do they have a different distribution across their English uh, abilities than the bad or the average math group? Or I could say it vice versa. People that are bad at English, if I look at how they perform on math, are they different from how the people that are good at English in their math performance? I mean, I could phrase, I could phrase the, the, the interesting questions revealed in this table from the row side or from the column side, or I could phrase it symmetrically in the way, is there a dependency or is it independent? Is there a relation between math skills and English skills? That is a symmetric way of asking the same. All these three questions I said here are equivalent. It's really the same questions asked, but asked in three different ways. And if, you, if the data is like this, maybe this one is the right way to put it. You could always put it like this, but you could also put it row-wise or column-wise, depending on who you are. If you're, depending whether you're interested in English or Danish, maybe. The point is, the way we do hypothesis testing on these tables is just do what I, what I taught you. Find the chi-squared statistic. It's just the same thing. It's just copying what I just showed you. You just have to do it across all rows and columns. It, doesn't, it could be two rows and two columns, a two by two table, but it could also be a five by four or a three by three table like the ones I showed you here. Compute all the observed and I, you shouldn't compute those, they are there. Look at all the observed values, that's the one I showed you in the tables. Go through all the expected value computations, I mean combine, what should you do? It's easy to do expected values, you should take the row total and the column total divided by the total total, and I should do that nine times, right? Combining all of these, that's all the possible combinations of row totals and column totals. Do all the nine computations and compare those nine expected values with the nine observed values. And we should use a chi-square distribution to evaluate whether it's a large deviation or not. Note that the chi-square is a positive thing. It will always give a positive signal. As long as the, the observed values become different from the expected values, no matter how they become different, no matter which direction they become different, the chi-square uh, statistic will give a positive signal. And the more positive, the larger the signal of the chi-square, the larger difference between the observed and the expected, and the more we are inclined to reject the null hypothesis of the story being the same. So it's just doing, repeating what I taught you here. Let's try at least, no, let's uh, finish and take just two, two minutes, final, final thing. 